Hello Aviator, Sky here, and today we will visit Sweden and get acquainted with the symbol of this country. No, not IKEA, but Saab, and one of their main creations in the field of civilian aviation. Saab 340 is a twin-engine turboprop regional aircraft developed by the Swedish Saab along with the American Fairchild in the early 1980s. Saab 2000 is the younger brother, created in the 1990s, as expected a little more modern, bigger and cooler. Nowadays they are no longer produced, but they are not leaving the sky anytime soon. Let's get acquainted with the real flying buses. Saab, founded in Sweden back in 1937, became famous mainly due to its cars. However, this company is diversified and is present both in the civilian sector and in the military. They also found their place in aviation. At least such aircraft as the Saab 35 Draken, 37 Viggen and the modern Yas 39 Gripen are quite familiar to many aviators. However, unlike the military branch, the civilian aviation business was not developed that much and in the 1970s the Swedish company decided to fix it. It took a lot of effort to figure out what kind of aircraft they could create without breaking or getting lost among the competitors. It was decided to make a regional passenger plane, with excellent flight and economic performance and at the same time with a small range and capacity. About 30 passengers. It wouldn't have to go against the giants and in its own niche it would be pretty compatible. 25 to 30 percent of the market could be occupied. As a power plant they immediately decided to use a turboprop. It is not very fashionable but in this niche it turns out to be much simpler and more economical. Besides, putting a jet engine on a plane this small would be an overkill. In addition, in the mid-1970s the oil crisis and the insane jump in fuel prices made the fuel-efficient turboprops a hit. Despite the fact that at first glance the plane seemed rather simple, the program to create it was complicated and expensive. Saab realized that they would not pull it off alone and started looking for partners. The search was not very long. In 1980 the Swedes made an arrangement with the Americans. Fairchild aircraft. Having vast experience in creating different models of aircraft, very different, Fairchild could add a number of important improvements and technologies to the project and their production capacity decently increased the aircraft's market potential. The name of the new aircraft was heard for the first time, Saab Fairchild SF340. Collaboration gave its results, the work became more active. In January 1983, the SF340 prototype made its first test flight from Linköping Airport, where the Saab assembly site is located. In total, three planes participated in the test, one of which was already a pre-production model. They certified the aircraft very quickly and it entered the market in 1984. Let's look at the plane they created. Fairchild and Saab divided the work and production into parts of the aircraft. The Americans were responsible for the wing, engine nacelles and stabilizers, while the Swedes took up the fuselage, vertical stabilizer and integration of all onboard systems. The final assembly was carried out at the Saab factory in Linköping, where the aircraft first flew. Ratio of responsibility for the program between Saab and Fairchild can be estimated at about 65 to 35. The wing is trapezoid, quite simple but has highly developed aerodynamics, the result of Fairchild's work. Mechanization is also classic, flaps on each console and spoilers, plus of course ailerons. There are no slats, the design is simpler and the flight performance is good without them. The aircraft could support flight at minimum speeds of about 170 km per hour or 90 knots. The tail of the aircraft is represented by straight stabilizer consoles and a keel with a long fin. Composites and honeycomb structures are used rather widely in the tail and rudders. In the wing this mainly concerns control surfaces and the cells. Most of the aircraft however remains aluminum. The landing gear is also a typical tricycle. Each leg is equipped with a two-wheeled bogey, which gave good flexibility in working with many airfields. They hold a 13-ton plane well. And of course the power plant. A pair of General Electric CT7 turboprops lifted the plane into the sky. They are in fact civilian versions of the GE T700 turboshaft engine, created in the late 1970s for military helicopters, originally American and later European. There are turboshaft and turboprop modifications. In our case of course we are talking about the turboprop. 
The basic SF340, later called the Saab 340A, was powered by the CT7 5A2 engines of approximately 1735 horsepower each, but in subsequent modifications they were replaced by the CT7 9B, the number of horses in which reached the mark of 1870 at maximum. Combined with four bladed propellers, they are able to accelerate the aircraft to a maximum speed of about 500 km per hour, or 270 knots, at altitudes up to 7.6 km, or 25,000 feet. Plus, the right engine has an additional function. It can turn off the propeller and, maintaining minimum mode, act as an auxiliary power unit. They didn't set the APU separately, too heavy for a small airplane. The fuselage of the aircraft is circular and for the most part quite ordinary. However, Saab in its part decided to keep up with the Americans in technology and began to manufacture some of the fuselage elements not by the usual method of riveting, but by the method of diffusion welding of panels, which made the structure lighter. The cabin of a rather modest in size aircraft also had modest volumes, a width of only 216 centimeters, or nearly 7 feet, almost a meter narrower than for example the DC-9, but not far from competitors such as the DHC-8 or Embraer 120. Such dimensions gave no choice in layouts, the seats were arranged according to a 3 in a row scheme, 2 plus 1. Moreover, in a number of layouts, in the rear of the cabin where the passage is no longer needed, four seats can be installed, like in a bus. This way, the cabin accommodates on average 34 passengers, with a maximum of 36. The plane cannot be called a pinnacle of comfort, but its operational capabilities, capacity, flexibility and range of up to 1700 kilometers or 930 miles made it very popular on regional routes. The fuselage is equipped with five doors. Two emergency exits over the wing, two in the front for boarding passengers and technical services, plus a hefty door in the tail, opening the way to the cargo compartment. Meanwhile the wall separating the cargo and passenger compartments can be removed, turning the airliner into a cargo plane, similar to the solutions used in the Pilatus airplanes. The A340's avionics were quite modern for its time. Its core was the FGAS system, brainchild of Collins. It included quite classical devices as well as the new digital control systems with interfaces on CRT displays. Thanks to it, a pair of pilots could easily control the plane. The Swiss Crossair became the star customer of the SF340, and the faith in reliability of the aircraft was proven very soon. One of the passengers of their early flights was Pope John Paul II. The manufacturer's plan was justified, the SF340 felt quite confident on the market, being actively produced and delivered. Sadly, the success of the aircraft did not lead to the proportional success of its parents. Even then, the corporate and financial difficulties of Fairchild forced them to reduce their activity in the civilian aviation sector, and their joint venture with the Swedes was not an exception. Nevertheless, with great effort and diligence, Saab managed to save the project by transferring production to its own facilities. The aircraft itself, by the end of the 1980s, received its current name, Saab 340. At that time, Saab released 340A, which was considered to be the basic version. In 1989, after closing their collaboration with Fairchild, they carried out a large-scale work, the result of which was Saab 340B, in fact the next generation with more powerful engines, improved tail and mechanization. The production of 340B continued until 1994, and the world saw about 200 aircraft, the most popular generation. However, the development of competitor planes and changes in market conditions required upgrades, and then the Swedes took a leap of faith. Back in the late 1980s, Saab noticed a growing need of operators for the aircraft with slightly higher capacity. After all, 34 people was not enough. The obvious solution was to stretch the fuselage, which without radical rework would provide 50 to 60 seats. And so they did. The result of Saab's work was the latest Saab 2000, which took off in 1992. Although the plane retained most of the elements of older brother, there was a lot of updates in it. The most obvious change was the length of the fuselage, which jumped 7.5 meters, or over 24 feet. The span and size of the wings also increased, which allowed to increase the volume of fuel tanks. As a result, the flight range rose to the mark of 2,860 kilometers, or approximately 1,500 miles. 
Naturally, the weight of all this beauty also increased, almost doubled from 13 to 22 tons. The good old CT-7 could no longer cope with such a load, so the Americans in the nacelles got replaced by the British. A pair of turboprop Rolls-Royce AE2100P with 4,152 horsepower each. Monsters in comparison to the engines of the 340. They were reliable and quite economical, which aviators appreciated. These engines raced several other planes into the air, including one of the most famous transports, the C-130, in its current iteration J, Super Hercules. This pair was able not only to easily lift a heavier aircraft, but also to accelerate it to speeds of 360-370 knots, at an altitude of up to 9.5 kilometers. Among other things, the aircraft received significantly improved avionics and a new cockpit. A big deal was the fight against noise, the eternal problem of turboprops. The engines were located a little further from the fuselage, the new six-blade propeller was rotating slower, and, as a cherry on the cake, the aircraft received an active, noise and vibration suppressing system. For the beginning of the 1990s, an awesome innovation. The new plane took off in 1992 and was certified in 94, immediately heading to the Crosshair fleet, once the first customer of the original Saab 340. Of course, with the beginning of successful operation of the new model, everyone looked at the old one. Now it seemed really old. Saab immediately took up its modification, and although they did not make too serious changes, they did introduce a number of innovations from the 2000s. First of all, it was the new onboard system, a modern interior, and of course an active noise reduction system. So, in 1995, the sky saw the updated Saab 340B+. But the 1990s were not the best time for Saabs, and turboprop aircraft in general. Fuel prices fell, and it was often easier for airlines to operate the new jet regional planes, such as the Bombardier CRJ or Embraer ERJ. Demand started to fall. This whole decade Saab was desperately looking for customers, creating new, more specialized modifications. In addition to basic passenger aircraft, there were cargo transports, VIP liners, military modifications, naval patrols, and even airborne warning and control aircraft appeared, kinda like a mini AWACS. They were pretty good, many are being successfully operated to this day, but still, the local purchases could not replace the mass market demand production became unprofitable. Saab was considering selling the program to other companies, but there was no optimal options. As a result, in 1997, it was decided to stop the production. In 99, the final 459th Saab 340 flew into the skies. A similar fate befell the Model 2000, which, given its age, makes this story even sadder. In the same 1999, the final Saab 2000 was delivered to its customer. There were only 63 aircraft created. However, having completed the series production, Saab did not forget about their offspring. Given that hundreds of aircraft remained in operation at the beginning of the 21st century, the company did not just support them and supply spare parts, but also continued to modify existing machines. Ironically, the fuel prices jumped again, keeping the planes in the air. Of course, they were no longer competitive in the commercial air transportation market, but they were very well suited for various special tasks. The aircraft has proven good reliability. Since its first delivery in 1984, the Saab 340 was involved in 22 serious incidents and air crashes, with the death of 48 people, and that's 459 boards in several decades. Saab 2000 is not particularly representative in its numbers, but still, it got into trouble six times with the death of one person. From the point of view of soulless statistics, not bad. But of course, nothing lasts forever, and the Saabs are slowly leaving. At the beginning of 2020, about 200 planes remained in operation, the vast majority of which is the 340 model. Of the Model 2000, there is at most a couple dozen. And on this, we can end today's story. Like and subscribe to the channel. This year promises many interesting adventures, full of fast flights and soft landings.